Tonight, on the eve of his final All-Star appearance, TNT salutes Michael Jordan. A player, an athlete, a presence unlike any other. There's one player that's the perfect 10 that has it all. The perfect player to me is 6'6", 200 pounds, jump like Michael Jordan, wear number 23 like Michael Jordan, and play like Michael Jordan. If there was a basketball player in Webster's Dictionary, it didn't have to be a picture of Michael Jordan. I always have enormous respect and affection for Michael because uh, he was one of the few guys that played our game the way it should be played. I remember looking directly in his eyes and it was like, Whatever you do, whatever you say, we're going to beat you. He does whatever he has to do. I've watched everybody that you can mention, and this guy has done it better than anybody that played the game. Look at the air. Look at the hang time. Look at all In my life, I don't know that I ever saw another athlete with such a remarkable set of qualities of mind, body, and spirit. Superman is back in the building! Jordan on fire! How does he do that? How does he do that? I think he took the game to another level, and I think you had a generation of guys come behind him who've tried to reach that level. Whose game is it? It's Michael Jordan's game! This is probably the single most talented player that's ever played the game, and his impact on this league will be here forever. Michael Jordan! Those are images, no matter how many times you see them, that just never get old. Unless you're on the receiving end of some of those shots by Michael Jordan. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the All-Star Jam Session. I'm Ernie Johnson, and in the next 60 minutes, we are going to salute Michael Jordan. Soon he's going to turn 40 years old. Sooner than that, he's going to play in his final All-Star game here in Atlanta. And in the next 60 minutes, you're going to hear from Charles Barkley and Magic Johnson and Kenny Smith and Danny Ainge, guys who have played with and against the one and only Michael Jordan. That comes your way momentarily. The whole centerpiece of that is a conversation that MJ had with John Thompson. And then an all-star preview show comes your way from seven till eight. And then at eight o'clock, all the fun and games across the street at Phillips Arena, the skills challenge, the Jeep all-star hoop it up, the 1-800 call ATT shootout, and the Sprite rising stars slam dunk. Tomorrow night, 7.30, a special edition of Inside the NBA, the All-Star Edition presented by Hyundai, including a live report from China where Yao Ming's former teammates on the Shanghai Sharks will be uh, ready to watch him perform in his first ever NBA All-Star game, which comes your way at 8 o'clock. Special halftime performer is Mariah Carey. And of course, have I mentioned it's exclusively on TNT. Now the NBA.com poll, we want to know what you feel is Michael Jordan's greatest play. We could have chosen any one of a hundred of them, but we've narrowed it down to five. You got the shot, the circus flip, the great escape, the switch of hands, or the career capper. You can log on to NBA.com or AOL keyword NBA.com. And if you need your memory refreshed about those plays, well, here they are. Inbounds pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line. A shot on Elo. Guy! The Bulls win! They win! That was uh, get the ball, Michael. Everybody get the out of the way. <laughs> Play the basket. Michael. Oh, my goodness! Oh, oh, oh. oh baby, what a sensational play! Knicks have left by as many as 17. Jordan trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a move by Jordan! It counts! And the foul! That is one of the moves of the season. Championship number six, Jordan, open, 
Chicago with the lead. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship. Here on TNT, we're going to get it started. Michael Jordan's conversation with John Thompson. MJ, a winner, a champion, but the bottom line, a competitor. Have you ever met anyone that you felt was as competitive as you are? Um, no. Yeah, I just feel that you know, my, my competitive drive is just far greater than anyone else that I've met. Michael Jordan fans, the old 23 from the Chicago days, prominently featured there. Ernie Johnson back at you from the jam session, and we want to bring Kenny the Jet Smith on here first today as we get started in this salute to Michael Jordan because you were there in North Carolina when it all got started. His last year was your first year. What was that like? It, it was very interesting because it, right now, obviously he wasn't a player that he became, but you saw all of the qualities that you that he, you would want in a player that he had and he possessed, but he coupled them and put them all together uh, when he got to the actual NBA. Because I didn't think he was going to be as good as he is now, to be honest. I really didn't think that. Well, was he a typical college kid, or was there something special? Was he treated with reverence around there, uh, Chapel Hill? No, no, no. Sam Perkins actually was the, the player everyone uh, idolized at the school. Michael was kind of like a little bit of a second fiddle, because Sam was a four-year All-American as well. But what I do remember is playing a lot of times in the summer league and, and in the summertime. And we would play game after game after game. And Michael would always, after the, first, after the game, stand in the middle of the court while everyone would go get water. So we'd come back, he's still there. He's been doing that after every game. So one day I was just like, Mike, why are you standing in the half court? He's like, because when everybody's off the court, I want to say that I'm still on the court more than anyone. So I was like, okay, let me stand in half court with Mike. <laughs> like Mike. <laughs> exactly. He wanted to be like Mike. What do you say we get this thing started? The conversation between Michael Jordan and John Thompson, the former North Carolina legend and the longtime Georgetown head coach. You've had a lot of fantastic moments in sports. What's the greatest moment? I mean, what started everything, you don't should Don't say know. that. <laughs> don't say, don't say the shot against Georgetown. Yeah, that was the greatest moment because I think that took me from a, if I had any doubts about playing on college level or playing with the big guys, you know, that shot gave me the confidence that I belong where I was, you know, and that it was, you know, if you put your mind to doing whatever you want to do, you know, good things can happen. You know, so before anything else happened with Michael Jordan outside of that, that game and you know, against you guys, that shot gave me the idea that I could be better than what people think and I can, you know, surpass any expectations that I may have for myself. Let me turn it. What's your greatest disappointment in sports? I haven't had any disappointments. I mean, you know, sports is a, is, is, is a tool that teaches you know, and it teaches you bad things. It can also teach you good things. It's how you perceive those things. I've looked at every experience that I've had, negative and positive, and, and taken that as a positive. You know, if I wouldn't change anything because I think it would alter some of the other things that happened. You know, so when I look back, I can't say that I've had any bad things happen. Sure, I mean, you don't want bad things to happen, but you deal with bad things. You can't have good or you know, without bad. When you look back at your career, particularly in the NBA, when you started off in the NBA, you did a lot of exceptional things yourself individually. Right. And then later on, 96, 98, you guys start really winning championships. Right. Evaluate the difference in the two. Well, I even go back further. I mean, you come out of college, you got a lot of gifted talent and some knowledge from your coach, you know. And you, when you get to the pros, you have to blend that knowledge as well as your individual talent. And you don't know where you stand. You know, you go into, I came into the league thinking I was the last on the totem pole. That was my thinking. I didn't come in thinking I was on top. So I had to work my way past all my teammates and they're all guys within the league to prove and establish myself as a basketball player. So, you know, I was gifted. I was talented. You know, I knew how to play the game. I didn't know how to play the game on the professional level. I had mm -hmm. to learn that. And it took some years of learning, watching Magic Johnson, watching Larry Bird. Let us see how they can play, you know, impact games when they're not scoring, or you know they score four points, they still make the you know the big plays down the stretch. 
these are things that you learn in, in, in the process of, of maturing in this league, you know. And as I watch, I began to adapt and I became more complete. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't one dimensional. The one thing I never wanted to be was one dimensional. You know, everyone saw me as just a scorer, one on one player, but I knew I was better than that. I came from a great program at North Carolina, teach you how to do more than just one thing. You know, so I spent the rest of my career trying to evolve as a player. And when our team got to a point where we can contend, I had to assume the leadership role. I had to, you know, other guys had to step forward. And then when we got to that point where we were winning, all the bases and all the foundation has been built. You know, now it's just a matter of can you mentally get yourself back each time to challenge yourself more so than the opponent, but yourself to be that hungry each and every time you stepped on the court. That took some evol evolving over the course of my career. And when I got to that point, I had no doubts that I couldn't win any time I stepped on the court or that I couldn't inspire people to win no matter how many times I stepped on the court. I tell people that from my observation of you, you're one of the most competitive individuals that I've ever seen. I would imagine if you were playing jacks with somebody, <laughs> you'd want to kill them. Uh, have you ever met anyone that you felt was as competitive as you are? Um, no. I just feel that you know my, my competitive drive is, is far greater than anyone else that I've met. You know, I think that I thrive on that. I think that's my biggest motivation in life, you know, is to 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 compete, you know, find different competitions and certain things in life and, and, and try to overcome that, you know, be it positive or negative. But uh, I have yet to meet someone who is as competitive as me, you know, and I just feel that much confident about my competitive drive. I want to ask you some true and false questions. Just three. Just three. Okay. Just three. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player ever. False. Why? Because I didn't play against you know all the great players prior to me, and I had those other players to influence my game. I mean that's. I mean it's, it's a great honor. Don't get me wrong, but I love to play against Jerry West to determine if I was a better guard than him or Oscar Robinson. But we'll never know. Michael Jordan. Had he stayed with baseball, would be playing in the big leagues now? I believe that. Uh, a lot of people may not, but I believe that. And I gave, for that short amount of time, I gave the dedication to the game of baseball uh, a true effort. You know, I wasn't you know, down, I wasn't there making money. I wasn't trying to endorse any product. You know, I was truly there for the love of the game. You know, I was up at six o'clock with bloody blisters all over my hand, just trying to trying to show that I could play this game. I grew up playing this game. I was, you know, I, I loved baseball. And at the time that I stepped away was a time where, you know, I was being asked to be uh, being thrown into, a, you know, a situation that involved, you know, baseball strikes and things of that nature. And that was never my intent, you know. So I kind of walked away before, you know, before I was thrust into that whole event. Michael Jordan will absolutely never play in another NBA game after this season? That's, that's a fact. Uh, I will not play in another NBA game. You know, I will play basketball. I'm glad you said NBA game. But I, I, mean, I got kids who love the game of basketball. I got friends who love to talk trash about me. I got a lot of young kids who love to compete against me at my camp. I'm still going to play the game of basketball. But from an NBA standpoint, that's it. This is the, the last year. I seen him do things that you can't even dream about doing. I seen him go up on one side of the lane, get bumped, still up in the air, twist the ball, do all this in the air, and lay it up on the other side. You can't do that. One play really sticks out of my mind. I will never forget. I have it on tape at home. We play New Jersey Nets. Michael get the ball, and he maneuvers inside outside, around, back. I mean, it was unbelievable. It makes the shot. I mean, he's the, he's the greatest. I remember him getting the steal, tiptoeing, throwing it in, coming out of bounds, coming back inbounds. Then he turns his back, hits it off the glass, and gets a foul. Just watching him in motion was really exciting. You know, just seeing him shed those tears after winning that first championship, you know, he had that a lot of weight off his shoulders to be able to win a championship and be compared some of the greatest players that ever played the game. 
I tell you a story that I think summed the whole thing up. When we was playing in Chicago, they switched and put John Stockton on it. He turned around and dunked on Stockton. So some guy got up and said, hey, Jordan, pick on somebody your own size. Next time down the floor, he dunked on Mel Turpin and went over and looked at the guy and said, was he big enough? Just some of the uh, marvelous stories about the career of Michael Jordan. I'm joined by a guy who's got a few of those himself, Charles Barkley. You guys are pretty tight. Uh, got a favorite Michael story, Chuck? Well, in 1984 when I tried out for the Olympic team, I didn't really want to go because I didn't think I was good as those guys who went to the big schools. So my coach, Sonny Smith, talked me into going. And when I got there, I actually played real well. And when I got back, he said, what do you think? I said, coach, if I get in shape and I work hard, I can be a good player. But I played against this one guy. I've never <laughs> seen anybody that good. And his name is Michael Jordan. And that's, this is when he was back in college. I never expected him to do what he did when he got to the NBA. But the first time I played against him for like a week, I knew he was the best I'd ever seen. And you make a good point there because there was nobody, and we're we'll talking to you in our, in our round table too with more on this, Charles, but there was nobody with the combination of will and skill, and nobody, as he told John Thompson, with that kind of creativity. Ask you something, Mike. A lot of kids copy you, and a lot of things that you did were things that people had never seen before. Did you ever practice those things, that creativity, that self-expression that you did? Some of those shots you made. No, I never did. I mean, um, you know, obviously, when you're as a kid, you want to count down five, four, three, two, one to make the <laughs> game-winning shot. Yes, but I mean, in terms of the creativeness, I think you've seen it. You know, it has happened in, in situations where the defense dictates what your reaction may be. But then you, once you do it once, you know you have a gift of talent to create. You know, in any other situation, you try to alter, you try to change. But all it was was the expansion of Elgin Baylor, Dr. J, all the guys who was created before you. And, and I grew up watching them, so the vision was there. It's just the, the creativity expanded with my talent. What motivates you, fear or the feeling of wanting to conquer or be successful? What motivates me is the unknown. No one knows. You know, they can all speculate, but no one really knows. And you know, when you look at my career from you know, high school all the way up through, you know, through the pros, no one knew what Michael Jordan was capable of. You know, and myself, I didn't know. You know but that, I didn't let that stop me. You know, and I, I let that motivate me more so than anything that, you know, as long as it's unknown, that means I have a chance. You know, and that's the way I, pers I pursued my whole career. Have, have you ever gone on the court and been afraid? No, I've never been afraid. I mean, obviously you're nervous, mm -hmm. but afraid means you're not confident in your skills. I have total confidence in my skills, so I'm not afraid. Of all the rivalries which you've had, which is, is the toughest one you've ever had as an individual? As an individual, it was probably the Detroit Pistons. Uh -huh. You know, when, when we were trying to get over that hump, you know I mean, we had the battle, uh, I, I wouldn't say fear, but intimidation, you know, because to some extent it got away from clean basketball, you know, the basketball that you grew up playing. <laughs> it got to more where, you know, yes, one hard foul could end your career, basically. You gotta have, you overcome that intimidation factor to keep going to the basket keep taking that shot, keep aggressively attacking them, you know, and I think as much as it was a battle, I mean, it was, once we accomplished that, it was unbelievable success, and no one else could challenge us that way, I didn't think, as a team, or even as individuals, to a point where, you know, it bothers us, you know, that was good for us, that was good for me to go through that, and it only made me a tougher player. 
How about from a personal standpoint? All players have one player you play against that you say, hey, I enjoy playing against this guy and I'm looking forward to it and I just want to show him. It changed from player to player. Magic Johnson, obviously, because of his notoriety and Larry Bird, his notoriety, that we had to get past him. Or I had to get past him individually before I gained any credibility. I could never get into their ballpark. I had to win championships. I had to win MVPs. I had to make impacts on my team. So that became a challenge for me. Clyde Drexler, who, you know, in essence, we were compared. You know, we were, you know, viewed as being similar. I wanted to show the difference. I felt like I was, it was no comparison. It was no closeness. It was totally a separation between he and I. Uh, every time we battled, we battled with, I battled with that notion in mind, you know, that I wanted to separate myself from him. I mean, we're good friends, don't, don't get me wrong, but it was just that, and how people perceived us in our games. You know, I wanted to excel my game and, and, and isolate my game from everybody else. That I was more than just, you know, a few dimensional, even when it came to Magic Johnson. And I, I mean, Magic Johnson was a you know, crowd pleaser. He was a you know, good offensive player. He was a great motivator, you know, average defensive player. You know, I, I wanted to change that. I wanted to take another step. I wanted to do all those things, you know, that it could separate me from Magic Johnson. You know, I'm not saying he wasn't great, he still is great. But we're great in our own different way, you know. And that was motivational for me, you know. And to this day, it still is. You did an awful lot of scoring, big game situations. Who did the best job defending Michael Jordan? During my heyday, I mean, we didn't have, they didn't have one man, you know. They had, you know, there was not one guy that no, you waited to see coming. No, I mean, I knew Dumas. Dumas okay. positioned himself defensively great, you know, with help. He knew he had Rami, he had Lambie, he had everybody helping, you know. Was, but he could position himself great with me, and that was a great challenge to try to outthink him because he was a great thinker on defense. He tried to take away some of my advantages. I tried to expand on my advantages, and I tried to attack him where he had weaknesses, you know, utilizing my size. You know, trying to get him in a one-on-one -on -one situation before the defense could come and help him. You know, that, you know, I, I would say he was the guy that made me or forced me to expand from an offensive standpoint. How would you have guarded Michael Jordan? I made him shoot the jump shot. You know, I, even though, you know, when he drives, he penetrates, he can involve a lot of other people. If he stands out and shoots the jump shot, you only got one person you got to worry about. And I don't think he can score 100 points. I don't think. <laughs> I do. <laughs> From TNT, one last chance to see one living legend one last time. See Michael Jordan rise to greatness in his final All-Star appearance, the 2003 NBA All-Star Game, tomorrow starting at 8 Eastern, only on TNT. Back here at the jam session where there is a very little room to breathe today. I think everybody in Atlanta is in this place showing off varying degrees of skill. And we welcome you back to All-Star Weekend here on TNT. Ernie Johnson joined now by Irvin Magic Johnson. And in that last segment, as we salute Michael Jordan, he's talking about using you as kind of a barometer and a measuring stick and kind of, I need to improve this way or I want to improve that way. I'll never be uh, getting the notoriety unless I get those rings and that kind of thing. What's your reaction to that? Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's an honor to be used uh, as a barometer when you talk about Michael Jordan. I think what, what happened was Larry Bird and I started it off and we thought we had something special until this guy named Michael Jordan <laughs> came into the league. And he took the league and to a, another level. He took basketball to another level and he took the skill of basketball, of a basketball player, to another level. There's never been anybody quite like Michael. There probably never will be. And I tell you, we all used to go out, Larry and I, and try to keep up with this guy in terms of uh, skill level. We knew he was practicing 10 hours a day. That made <laughs> us have to practice 12 hours a day. And he told us something interesting at the uh, Olympics, and I'll never forget this, talking to Larry and I. He said, look, you guys are the old sheriff, but there's a new sheriff in town, and his <laughs> name is Michael Jordan. So I'm going to take it from where you guys started, and I'm going to take it to a whole nother level. And Michael, 
you did just that. Exactly, exactly right. If you look at the stats for a guy like Michael Jordan, certainly they stack up against all kind of players of, uh, of all time in this league, but how important were they? Let's return to John and MJ. What impact does your statistical place in the NBA have on you? Well, that, that never drove me. You know, I mean, the stats only add up when you put forth the effort and you don't worry about it. You know, good things happen to those people that, that work hard. If I sit here and play for the stats, I would have never retired in 93. Well, I still probably be chasing Will Chamberlain's all-time, you know, or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar all-time scoring lead. I mean, that doesn't drive me. I mean, sure, I mean, it defines to some extent for people who don't know me or, you know, 20 years from now would we'll never know who Michael Jordan really is. But based on the stats, he must have been pretty decent. You know, th those are only ways that I look at stats. Other than that, you know, it's all about winning championships and, and winning. You know, the stats that matters to me is the games that we win and the rings that you collect. Mike, did you achieve what you in in intended to achieve with the Wizards? I think I've achieved it only if the players take what I've done over the last couple of years and moving in the right direction. I mean, what we have done is we brought hope to the city of Washington. You know, and I think that winning and finishing out this year with a you know, good playoff run, I think shows if you believe in something, you put forth the effort. It's not about age, it's not about ability. It's about believing that you can come together as 12 to 15 men team and put forth the effort, fulfill a role, and go out there and play hard. Good things are happening. You have sons that play. Right. Were right. they critical or positive about your performance when you came back because they were old enough to see you play? Uh, yeah. Was that fun? It is fun. I mean, because <laughs> I think it's, you know, they critique with the, not really knowing but gathering information for what I tell them, you know, and they have their favorite players, you know, which in essence I have to compete against those players, you know, and I find myself if, if I have a good game against one of those players, believe me, I'm going to let him know it, you know, as much as he's going to probably make excuses why the other player or the player that I'm playing against didn't have a great game against me. but. That's fun. I mean, from a father, I mean, that's great to have a conversation about your game with your son. When you see young kids talk about Michael and how Michael did things, and I want to get up early in the morning and play, I want to leave the gym late and play, I want to work, what impact does that have on you? It's, a, it's truly inspiration that, you know, my love has been seen, uh, my love has been passed on. My obligation to the game of basketball has been fulfilled because someone did that to me. And in turn, I'm doing that for other players and, and for the game of basketball. I look at yourself and Jerry Rice. Have you guys extended the life expectancy of an athlete? Yeah, I, I think we have. I think there's some truth to that. I think two things have to come in place. You gotta have true love for what you're doing and you have to be very lucky in terms of health. You know, if you have both of them, then you can extend, you can play as long as you want because you got to put forth the effort. I mean, you know, when you look at Jerry, Jerry's a great friend. I think our careers parallel a lot. He's a couple years older than me. I let him remind, I remind him of that. <laughs> but his desire to be the best at what he does keeps him pushing, not just during the season, but, you know, during the off season or physically preparing himself for a season and mentally finding ways to challenge himself or listen to the naysayers as motivation, things of that nature, and keep and staying healthy. If you can do that, then, you know, yeah, you can extend the you know, longevity of someone's career, you know, but if you take it for granted, you can't. You know, I don't think either one of us take what we have done and what we love for granted. play a complete basketball game. I, I don't think one man can beat the Boston Celtics. Michael Jordan, the basket good. What a great shot. And Jordan with 40 points. You talk about sheer determination. Michael Jordan has those qualities. Jordan oh. ties the game. Oh, boy. 63 points, and you're looking at an all-time record. Oh, boy. Michael Jordan. Jordan against McGee, right of the lane, leans in, pops the shot, no, tips it in! 
23 straight points for Jordan. A standing O in Chicago Stadium. 34 for Jordan. Michael on the drive inside, scoops it in. 50. Drive in the lane, shoots under pressure. Good and a foul call. That's 61 for Jordan. Maybe ever. Ladies and gentlemen, check it out, John. Michael comes back to New York City. He loves playing in this gym. Check it out, John. Michael Jordan off to the fast start. This time for the pull up. And he is on fire. Jordan off the pull up. Puts the move. Oh. for the NBA this season. Now the big story here tonight concerning Michael Jordan's physical conditions. He is suffering from flu-like symptoms. You wonder just how much, how long, and how hard he'll be able to go. Michael Jordan continues to blaze away, illness or not. Demanded the ball, back Michael, open three, yeah! Oh. They lead it! 38 points for the King! Yeah. Suck a dagger at him with a three! A courageous, classic performance by the fluid Michael Jordan. A lot of players wondering what they needed to do to get the flu after that performance by Michael Jordan. Joined now by Danny Ainge, and when we came on the air tonight, we talked about the fact that these images of Michael never get old unless you're on the receiving end. And we saw you a couple of times in those clips. Take me through first that Boston massacre. <laughs> I've watched that on Sports Classic a couple of times, and that does bring back some bad memories. But Ernie, it's amazing because I played golf with Michael the day before, the Saturday, in Framingham, Massachusetts, with a good friend of ours, Mike Carey. And we were out playing, and I destroyed Michael that day. He was not happy. <laughs> I made a bad, bad mistake. In the locker room after the game, I remember Walton and Bird and McHale and those guys. Michael had come to life. It was they were we were all in awe of his performance. You know, in in that game, we uh, we have been able to track down video of you in that 63 point game, and and here we go, you blowing past Michael well, to the hole. You know, what's funny about that that game was the 63 points. And then I had to score. DJ picked up his fifth foul halfway through the third quarter. I had not scored a point in that game. I ended up with 24 through the double overtimes, but Michael's 63 was unreal. We appreciate you bringing that tape with you, by the way. <laughs> and now on that Portland thing, the game, everybody remembers by the image of he couldn't figure it out either. What are your memories of that game? Well, I remember that Clyde Drexler and him were rivals to some extent, like he mentioned earlier in the show. And Clyde was the runner-up MVP that year. And Michael, you could tell that opening tip, Clyde couldn't catch a ball. Michael wanted to separate himself. Not only the three-pointers, which was so unusual for his game, but defensively, he took Clyde out of that game. And that was game one, and he proved to the world right there, don't compare me and Clyde. Danny Angel will be sticking around for our roundtable along with Charles and Kenny and Magic Johnson. One more segment here of this interview with John Thompson. What will be the impact, the lasting legacy of MJ? Sometimes I dream that he is me. in the world to cover my main man, Michael Jordan. Oh! Michael Jordan! No! Who'd you expect? You want my fight? I'm not going to sing. When did you first realize that no matter where you went, what you would do, you were known? And what impact did that have on your lifestyle? I started taking trips with Nike. You know, Nike took me over to Europe to try to, you know, to push the shoes and push the brand. And as I was over there, more and more people became aware of who I was. Not because of the shoes, but because of the way that I was playing. And at the same time, the, the league has started to expand and, and try to get 
the game of basketball, NBA basketball worldwide. Uh, and the dream team, you know, blew it wide open. You know, I think that was when, you know, I couldn't go anywhere in the, in the world uh, and walk the streets. You know, I used to could go to Paris or, you know, Milan or someone like that and just walk the streets and no one would know. I can sit outside and, you know, with, with my family or friends or whatever and just enjoy it. But ever since, you know, the dream team, things is just totally gone berserk. I mean, I, no matter where I go in, in Europe, it's, it's no different than the States. How difficult has it been being Michael Jordan? It's been difficult, but it's, it's got its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, the, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages, no matter how you look at it. And you know, I, the inspiration that I try to pass on, you know, the, the, the admiration that I gain back, I wouldn't give that, give that away for nothing. As you leave the game, what message do you want to leave to young athletes that are coming on? Be true to the game, because the game will be true to you. If you try to shortcut the game, then the game's going to shortcut you. If you put forth the effort, you know, good things will be bestowed upon you. You know, that's truly about the game. And in some ways, that's about life, too. Now, we asked you a short time ago, what do you think Michael Jordan's greatest play was? And you could log on nba.com or aol keyword nba.com and so far we're gonna have the results next hour but so far it's the switch of hands against the lakers the marv albert spectacular move by michael jordan that leads the way right now and does that sit well with everybody at this point oh, i gotta uh, go with the last utah shot that, that showed everything. That showed fundamentals. That showed his escape dribble. That showed him follow through. That showed everything about a game winning situation. To me, that capsizes his whole career in one play. Welcome to our roundtable discussion now as we uh, wrap up this salute to Michael Jordan. Danny Ainge, Magic Johnson, Kenny Smith, Charles Barkley. You've heard from all of them individually so far and now as a group. Let me just throw this out. Is he the greatest player ever? Danny. Yes because he played both ends of the court. He offensively, there could be some debate, although I think he was one of the best offensive players, but because of everything he did, yes, and his competitive edge. Magic. No, he's the greatest player, and Bill Russell is the greatest winner. Uh, Michael, no, no question, Michael is heads and shoulder above everybody else. He not only dominated on offense and defense, but he also dominated. There will no, never be a basketball player and I don't know if there will ever be another athlete to make as much money on the court and off the court as Michael Jordan. It's just, it, he, he, he will go down like Muhammad Ali and maybe even bigger. Well, I think the, the point he touched on, Michael was, they're always trying to say, who's the next Michael Jordan? And they only look at offense. Michael Jordan was the best defensive player who played during our era. And that's what separated him. And I have to agree again. Uh, the domination everywhere. There's no, no players today, like my, like Charles just said, that can dominate a game without scoring 30. There's been games where Michael didn't score 30, but dominate the game from defense, assist. Because at one year he was all, he played the point guard position. People forget that as well. So the assist as well and the defensive end, total package. By the way, Charles, you're you're gonna be all right here with the voice. No, no, no. yeah. No, 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 no. You have to yell and scream the whole time. Ernie. Ernie. <laughs> it must have been the rookie game. He was yes, yelling yes. and screaming have, at that. Have Charles whisper in Kenny's ear and every I'm answer he has. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Kenny, you can relate I'll, it to I'll everybody. The world. <laughs> we, we hear so much about the great will to win that, that Michael had. In the ratio of will and skill, um, I mean, how did that work out for him? Well, it's, well, a, well it's a combination of both. Okay. You, you have to have both. You know, the will to win, drive, what drive, what drove him. And then the skill level is what made him. See, he would, he would have been only Michael Jordan with just the will to win, but he was Michael Air Jordan with the skill to win. <laughs> well, the other thing to add to that is, I agree with Magic, but not only that, but his will drove other players' will. You know, Scotty became, had a stronger will. Horace Grant, B.J. Armstrong, all these guys, his will was contagious. And that's what I think makes him even more special, what he did on the court, what he made other players become. And people forget, 
He was the best fundamental player in basketball. And that's what everyone sees the dunks and they see the highlights. But he was the first to me, the first athlete to come into the game with fundamental skills as his basis. And then his athleticism just took him to where he yeah. is today. Where did he learn those that, fundamentals? North Carolina. At North Carolina, Carolina in college. What to you? Uh, hey, I got fundamentals, but I didn't have athleticism or will. Is that something that Charles <laughs> whispered to you, or do you have something to add on that front? Well, no matter how much will you got, if you don't have talent, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of a kind, remains one of a kind, and tomorrow he plays in his final NBA All-Star game here in Atlanta. Michael Jordan, our salute here on TNT. We'll be back. Hi, my name is Michael Jordan. I want you to take a trip with me and discover the secrets that I've known for many years. The man was truly destined to fly. If I get the ball, you have mercy. There's nothing that you can say or do about it. You own the ball, you own the game, you own the guy who's guarding you. You can actually play him like a puppet. As long as we're on this earth, I think everybody wants to be known as a winner. The only way you can be remembered on this earth is to win. How would you like to be remembered as a winner that, that, that sacrificed every aspect of this game for that sake of winning, you know? And it would do anything to cover holes of a team or a player so that we can win. And I truly love the game of basketball. I truly love the game. I wouldn't be playing if I didn't love the game. It's truly for the love of the game of basketball. in a class all his own, Michael Jordan. Hope you've enjoyed our hour-long salute to MJ on the eve of his final All-Star appearance. We're just getting warm here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We've got another hour of, to go of a, a special All-Star preview. Magic Johnson, Charles Barkley will stick around for that. And we invite you to stick around here at the Jam Session in Atlanta, where it's All-Star Weekend and all roads lead to the Jam Session and Phillips Arena. We'll be back.